Hi, my name is Dr. Tamar Andrews and I'm here on the playground. And today I have the extreme honor of um, talking to one of my colleagues and someone I look up to, Sasha Kopp, who uh, I'm gonna let her tell you all the things that she does. So Sasha, give us an intro to who you are and what you do in the early childhood space. Hi Tamar, it's so wonderful to be here and to be on the playground with you. I work at the Jewish Education Project in New York as a community early childhood and family engagement consultant to New York early childhood educators, which means I support directors, teachers, family engagement professionals to help inspire and empower them to create just the best places for young children to thrive in their communities. And I love working with educators and I'm visiting different schools and seeing ways that they engage children in all sorts of wonderful unique ways. And I have to say, as the beneficiary of some of your uh, lectures and workshops, I will say that you are definitely an inspiration in our field. Um, to kind of frame today's um, webinar, I wanted to frame everything within the confines of social emotional development, just um, for ease of use, if you will. So um, what do you see as number one, the main purpose um, of social emotional development? Why do we even have to focus on it? It's the most important thing. We know that. Um, we need early childhood as a place where a child goes from their own home, where they're only the only kid in the space, well, not necessarily, but they're a child in their family. Um, and then they go to this place where they're a member of a group with people beyond their family. That's their first entry into what it is to be a member of society in the world with people who are different from who you are. And that's so fundamental to why we're socializing children, because we're helping them be the best little humans that they can be. Um, and really, a lot of that is just about who we are socially, and then how do we figure out how to regulate and understand our own emotions to be able to be present with other people. Um, so the skills that we're learning in early childhood are really essential. It's how to be independent. Um, yeah. How do we engage with others? How do we solve big problems? How do we deal with our own frustration? Also, like, how do we deal with our joy? Like, how do we wait our turn to raise our hand and listen to other kids? And we know we have an idea that's so important. Yeah, um, I remember. Yeah, I remember growing up. I think my preschool was called Plumber Park, and everybody in the neighborhood would just go to the park, and that was our preschool. And uh, I mean, we're talking decades and decades ago. And uh, I think I agree with you, especially in the way that you suc succinctly put it. Um, how to manage both our frustrations, our, our sadness, and our joy. Um, I see, though, also that in the early childhood realm, and you know, both as a person who manages a child care center and as a professor, everybody's always looking for the ABCs and one, two, threes. How do we teach the academics? And um, in fact, if you look at most assessment tools, for early childhood, we're assessing them in those academics. What would you say to people um, who ask, how do we assess for social emotional development? Are, is there anything we can use? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw in another monkey wrench into this. Everybody now talks about play-based programs. Is that play taking away from the academics that so many of our uh, stakeholders wanna see done in early childhood? There's a lot in there. And yeah. I just want to start with play is essential for future academic success because we need play to understand symbolic learning. What an apple is, or take a rock. Pretend a rock could be a holla, a piece of bread, an apple, um, a hat. It can be so many different things. When we look at a letter, it's just lines on a page. Until we can understand that one object represents another object, can we understand that the letter A makes the sound a? Uh? We need to understand that symbolic thinking and teach it and foster it in order for us to be able to be successful in those academic skills. And parents don't see the connection all the time. And that's really hard to be able to explain without them understanding each of the stages of child development and how young children learn, because they're constantly learning through the exploration of play. Right. It's not right. taking away, right. it's actually like creating a foundation right. for future academic success. Right. Um, I think there's more to your question. Let's yeah, let me ask you this, though. Um, I'm going to go very now pinpoint into the um, play representative of symbolic play and uh, stages of development, if you will. So 
while we are discussing play, how then would you counsel teachers or directors to document that kind of growth from play into future academic success? What would be like, how could I tell that to a parent? Great question. A, a lot of teaching, we should really be sitting back and observing what children are doing, because that's really what tells us where they are in their development and how they're growing. So observing what they're noticing, how they're interacting with objects, how they're interacting with each other, and taking some detailed notes. What are they saying? Um, what are they playing with? How are they playing with? Are they playing with one child? Are they playing with many child children? Do they, um, do they have specific ways that they play? Are they always a leader? Are they always the follower? What happens if you as a teacher intervene and say, okay, like this time when we play um, good guys, bad guys in the playground, this child's going to be a good guy and point at the child that's always the bad guy and switch it up a little bit. And how do they all interact? How is that a different scenario than what it typically is? That can show growth and development. Yeah. Um, being a leader is a really challenging thing and it needs to be taught and we need to practice. And unless we practice, they can't grow. And so that's something that I think a lot of parents actually want to see is leadership um, and how that like starts on the playground. So I, I know you, and I know that you take a great deal in pride in um, mentoring other programs in the value of outdoor play specifically. And you mentioned a rock. Um, <laughs> How, how do you balance that with the pressure, and I'll call it pressure, that many child care centers feel in purchasing everything they see in a early childhood catalog? Yeah. There's a lot of pressure out there to have the right supplies, to look shiny, look new. And I think that we need to remember that imagination is a goal. And there's a lot of I love that. Can we stop there for a second? Oh, that might be the line that I take out of this whole webinar. Imagination is a goal. Can because you just go deeper into that? I cool. love I, everybody listening to this podcast <laughs> webinar. I want you to take that tagline from Sasha Kopp. Thank you. Um, and that goes back to this idea of good guys, bad guys on the playground, building with clay, exploring what a rock is, all of that is using your imagination. We can't be authors or scientists, um, world leaders, yes, yes, yeah. unless we have imagination to envision something which is not currently there. And that's what play is. So we need to allow children to play because we want to be able to build the muscle of using their imagination. And that is something that parents need to understand is it happening in the classroom through play every day. But I think I think it happens even more outdoors. I will share with you um, one of the things that I go around the world, uh, I do these workshops on STEM in early childhood and I always tell people it's not the academic part of STEM that's the most important. It's the curiosity, the imagination, um, future proofing our kids because the jobs that will exist in 20 years do not currently exist. The same way that the jobs we have now that we see in tech, medicine and other fields weren't around 20 years ago. And we have to future proof our kids. And I love that line that imagination is the goal because that's the only way we're going to future proof these kids, especially by allowing them to be outdoors. Yeah. And I think one of the beauty of being outdoors is that the kids have space. The teachers yes. aren't hovering over them. They're not putting words in their mouth. They're not asking them what they're doing or what they're drawing or who it's for, or what they did over the weekend. The kids are playing with each other or having time to be by themselves. And sometimes yes. we even get to be bored. And I think that's something that parents and teachers get anxious when kids are bored all the time. Yeah. And like that's when they are thinking and imagining and visioning or just watching and learning about the world. You know, I'm picturing, so important. I'm, picturing, I'm picturing in my head right now, you're talking and all these visions are coming to me. Children will always be at the door running outside for outside time, but you never see them anxiously lining up and running back indoors. You know, it's always the flow, the quick excite, you know, excitation and exaltation of running outside is not mirrored by coming back inside. So 
if a school, let's just say that, you know, I've got a class and we all talk about coming out of COVID and the isolation to, uh, as you say, coming back to socializing and being together. If I'm a school and I have a very limited budget, um, give me a few ways in which you would direct them to use those funds most appropriately to help support the imagination, the social emotional development and the play that is still grounded in future academic success? Like how would you have them spend that money? Indoors or outdoors? I'm gonna leave this to you. I want you to tell us what to do. Well, what, Sasha, so the first thing that pops in my head is that you should go to a local car shop and get some old tires. You don't need to spend a penny on that. Oh, wow. And bring kids outside and let them play with big objects that are heavy that help their growth, motor development and their cooperation together. Because tires are just really fun because kids can sit in them and on them and push them and they have to work together. And having a sense of teamwork is a really valuable um, opportunity for you to play outside. Okay, so um, I have my budget. I haven't spent a penny. I now have a yard full of tires. What's next? Um, baskets of different loose parts. So can you describe a little bit for those that are uninformed uh, and are not familiar with like Miriam Belagovsky's work, et cetera, the loose parts books. Um, tell us, give us examples of loose parts. Loose parts are just objects that can be used in more than one way. It could be a popsicle stick, a bottle cap, a bunch of rocks, going back to that, twigs, leaves, anything. Um, and they're used in ways that children are not making a product. They're just exploring the weight, how they balance, how do you move them on a space. Um, and they're creating either kind of art, kind of objects, they're manipulatives. They're using parts as a way for children to just understand. Um, and this is a process opportunity for kids to be able to work on focus, collaboration, or independent play, depending on how you set it up. Um, and it really can be a variety of different things. Sometimes you can create sets of loose parts that are all one color or all one material, such as metal or wood, um, mm. or things that you get from your lunch kit. If you're all doing your applesauce twisties that kind of look like propellers and collecting those in different colors. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of different ways to collect and then display loose parts. Um, it's wonderful and kids can access them on their own and be able to take them out and explore in just ways that they're thinking about. Sometimes you can set up provocations or invitations that connect loose parts to something else that you're studying, either a book or a holiday that's coming up. So um, let me ask you, let me ask you about that though, specifically. Um, there are proponents of play-based programs that will say that as soon as a teacher provides a provocation or an invitation, that you are actually no longer engaging in actual play because the teacher has now inserted him or herself in some way into the play. I think. When we talk about play-based education, there isn't one way to do it. It's a very loose term that lots of schools have held and shared, but it doesn't mean that they're doing the same thing. And so to give kids the freedom to, to have an adult share a provocation is not child-centered. We know that. Right. However, a child could take that provocation, start with it, and then go off in their own direction. That continues to be play. Um, it is a jumping off point for further exploration when the teacher then comes and then redirects the child to focus that on the initial provocation, then we're taking away the imagination. Then we're focusing on um, a yeah. product that is using these parts in a way that's not for them to be intended to be used. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a, a famous line about play and I have, um, I have taken it and, and switched it. You'll know what I'm talking about in a second. Um, we don't get burnt out. Uh, wait, how does it go? Um, we we don't stop playing because we get burnt out as teachers. We get burnt out as teachers because we stop playing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you know what the original quote is. Um, and what has been your experience when schools um, shift? And I'm going to talk now more about the emotional and social development of the teachers. What has been your experience? Uh, as to the culture of the schools when they have shifted from being more academically focused to more play-based focused. Have you seen a shift in the teachers? I think teachers really love when children are excited to learn. And yeah. when kids yeah. are playing, yeah. they are coming up with their own ideas. 
there's a natural energy in the room. Yeah. When teachers are bringing units to kids, they learn and they get excited about it. But it's a different sort of energy than it is when it's coming from them. And then teachers are helping them expand it and go more in depth. And it's exciting for teachers to co-collaborate with their class. They're being able to help children come up with their own questions, solve their own challenges, and explore a topic in ways that they are really excited to continue to learn about. And so it does really help that burnout. Um, it does help them want to be in the classroom, wanting to see what's going to happen next. Because year after year, if you do the same units, you get bored. Yeah. Every year you have different students. So why not utilize that and see how who are they in this world and what do they love to learn about? How do you get kids? And I'm thinking now of a few schools in my area in particular that um, have expressed their dismay that kids that are in some play-based programs they're finding are not academically ready for the rigors of the kindergarten and first grade in those private and public schools. And as such, the pressure on these play-based programs is becoming enormous because parents are complaining that the kids are no longer accepted from those play-based programs. Uh, to matriculate to the schools of their choice. How, how, do you, how do you help schools balance the two? Right, I think this goes back to the idea that play-based doesn't mean the same thing in every environment. And so okay. sometimes play-based means that there's a lot of toys in the room and kids are playing all day. Um, and that's great that kids are engaging in playing. And yet there does need to be a way to, for children to be in engaged play that does have goals that is either working with specific children and working through their feelings mm. in social emotional ways, or it's just exploring with blocks, taking on different roles in dramatic play, um, really making sure that kids are doing something where they are continuing to build skills through the play. So and meeting then, certain benchmarks, but still maintaining kind of the integrity of the play-based program. We want kids to remain curious. Yeah. And if you're just in a room with a bunch of toys every day, you know exactly what to expect. When teachers are creating environments that are different, that are meaningful, that are relevant to the children and their ideas, then they're curious to figure out how can I use this material? How can I play with it to explore the world around me, to learn more? And those are skills that help with kindergarten readiness. And educators need to document how children have explore materials in different ways over time. A lot of schools, and this isn't really play-based, but it's an example of progress, um, they do monthly self-portraits. And you can see the development of skills over time. Can you draw an enclosed circle? Where are the eyes? Where are the nose? And if you do this over a series of a year or two years, you see a lot of development. What does that look like if you observe a child in the dramatic play area? How much language do they use? How do they collaborate with others? Um, how are they using the objects in dramatic play in a symbolic way? Those are benchmarks that you can measure if you do observations regularly of how kids are exploring spaces. So then I have a, another tough question for you. Every one of your statements triggers another question. You said educators. I did. In your vast experience, how do you define an educator in early childhood? What, what are the credentials? What are the requirements to be considered an actual educator? Credentials is an interesting word for you to use there. Because um, I do think that there's a lot of experience that people have with young children that is really important that sometimes isn't measured by a credential. Educators are there to inspire and to impact young children's lives to give them a benchmark and a foundation for them to flourish and thrive. Um, but educators do need to know about child development. They need to know about who the learners are in the room um, and what who they are compared to other children that age. They need to be able to communicate with their parents, with their administrator about how children need to be supported to continue to grow and thrive. Right. And so those pieces can only be learned in an academic setting. Um, and whether it's a associate's program, a bachelor program, a master's program, I think you can be an educator at all of them. 
But I think also being an educator, you need to remain curious. You need to remain a learner, both about yourself and about your students. Yeah. Um, and continue to have a growth mindset that our world is changing. And so how we educate must also change along with it. We shouldn't be doing the same thing we've always done because we have different students in the room in a different moment in time. So to be a true educator means to really grow in your own practice amongst throughout your time. Let me let me ask you, this is, a, uh, I, I don't even know that I have the answer to this and I've been a professor now for almost 30 years. Are there some people in the field that you have seen just cannot become quality educators or are there people in the field who are not yet quality educators and they just haven't found the right person to train them? Like, can anybody be trained to, to do this? I think anyone can be trained. And I think there's a lot of people who don't consider themselves educators, but end up teaching in early childhood spaces. Mm. Say a and little I, more about that. What do you mean by they don't consider themselves? I think there's individuals who work in early childhood settings that went to school for something different, mm. um, who have had a different career in the past and have found themselves just kind of stumbled into it by chance, this either full-time or part-time job that allows them to have the life that they want. They're able to um, be out of the house for a little bit, potentially be available for their own children at the times that their children might right. need them. And they enjoy the work and don't consider themselves educators. And those are people who I think need the training the most. Yeah. The mindset shift is so important because they are educating every day and until they believe that they are, can they really reach their potential? So I'm sure we're, we're seeing more and more of that now as people tout uh, the teacher shortage. Um, I have been on a previous on the playground uh, webinar where I said, I don't believe that there's a teacher shortage. I think there's a shortage of compensation because if you pay enough, you'll find anybody to fill any job. Um, so can you speak a little bit to your experience and how you think we should solve some of this, the, the issues surrounding finding high quality educators um, for these critical years of development? What would you do? You're queen of the world. Fix our problem. It, we do need to throw money at the problem. Um, I really think that money needs to come from our government. We need to have, I was reading an article this morning by Elliot Haspel about how every teacher needs to make $40,000 a year. And if the state isn't doing that, the state does not care about childcare. Um, and 40,000 still feels so low. Like no, I, I was going to say much, in much Los more, Angeles. Yeah. It wouldn't work in New York either. Yeah. Um, but we still know that there are teachers out there who are making $12, $15 an hour. Yeah. And it's completely unacceptable. They're also schools need to offer benefits. Um, healthcare benefits, retirement benefits, benefits of sending your child to the preschool where you are working. I think that's a really important one that every teacher should be able to access free childcare for their own children. Yeah, we've got that here where I work. Oh, great. <laughs> um, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, we're also losing, there, there needs to be a new buzz about how important this work is. Like yeah. people aren't entering the field in the same way because they know it's such a low paying job. We need to not just elevate the role and the compensation, and, but we also need a whole marketing campaign. We need to share that this is the way to change society by yeah. impacting the lives of young children and their families and creating really kind humans from day one in the school. Um, you know, part of the issue though is from a very um, patriarchal, mm -hmm. United States, and I can't speak about other countries, I, I don't work there, but uh, the patriarchy of the United States was such that women belong at home until their children are five or six years old. And that is why we started off with first grade being the you know, the compulsory year of education. Um, even kindergarten in most states is not actually a compulsory age. And I think that we need to get in all fairness, either more women in government, women with young children, who we can actually, you know, uh, campaign to and say, hey, look, you're a working mom as well. Um, but I think men as well, you know, men in our society as well are now figuring out more and more as they have dual uh, households and we have a lot more same sex marriages and single parents and divorce that childcare um, is actually not 
the way to talk about it because when you talk about childcare in zero to five, you're actually demeaning our profession. So you talked about, you know, we have to have a, a advertisement campaign. What would you call the field of zero to five? Right. And I really actually think that child, the using the language of childcare is something that appeals to politicians because yes. childcare allows parents to work and grow our economy. Education for children is not their priority. Growing our economy is. And okay. that's something that is really tricky to navigate. We know so much brain development happens between birth through five. Oh yeah. And if we want to help create the next generation of leaders and of society, we need to be able to foster that time through really strong early childhood programs, with really wonderful trusted adults that help kids grow. So what to call it? I don't know. But I think early childhood education isn't working, and I think childcare also isn't working. And preschool is a terrible world. So yeah, and I know um, in California we just had a meeting of the minds in the state of California last week, and we came up with it's not a new term, but we agreed early care and education because it kind of encapsulates everything. I am I'm curious um, as we start heading towards the end of our meeting today. Would you be willing to help me lead another one of these on the playground? Um, I would even bring in some people from policy in early childhood. And I, I'm going to jump on you here and say, let's do a campaign. I'm wondering if, you know, playground might be the impetus through which we start a campaign and get people from all 50 states and territories um, to just start working on this. I don't know exactly what that work is, but I would follow the leader to the end of the earth if it will help us um, in what you say is the answer, which is we've got to throw more money at this. I don't think it's right that early care and education is not funded completely by the government. And yet we have K through college now in many states, K through community college is completely funded. And one thing that we need to keep in mind, and I think this rebrand and this campaign is amazing, and I'm 100% on board tomorrow, but that right now we have a lot of different systems in which early education and care take place. We have um, at-home centers, we have full-time daycare centers, we have part-time early childhood educational programs, the night care, yeah. and all of those things are valuable to be able to help parents work and children oh, take absolutely. care. And so there's a lot of talk about, oh, we'll just make universal pre-K, universal threes, universal twos, we'll have all these programs that are part of our educational system. What is working now is important and it helps different families receive the care that they need in order to do the jobs they need to do. And we need to continue this mixed delivery system and Agree to really champion, chip, champion that in government. I, I think that you have hit, exactly. If I've got somebody who has a little home daycare, three houses down from my house and the local public school offering the same thing is three miles from my house. I would much rather have my kid three houses down where I know them, I watch them, I see them, I, I'm part of the program. Um, and not only that, but we also can't, in trying to solve the problem, dismantle the economy of early care and education in this country, which is also an incredibly huge network of high quality providers. That at-home daycare provider needs to be making the same salary as the educator in that public school down the street. And right now the model does not give that, it's, it's, it's completely impossible for our at-home providers to make anywhere near where our public educators Correct. can or receive the benefits. Um, it's really, I mean, this is where we need to imagine, to go back to that. Yeah. Um, we need a lot of imagination to be able to change a system that is just not sustainable and that the government is not investing in and is crucial to every child and every family in our country. Yeah, um, I will say that there are, there are some strides uh, that are being made, but they're not happening fast enough or um, completely enough to encapsulate everybody involved in the field. Um, last comments on what would you like to see happening? What is the very next step? What do you see as being the very next step? I do think that we need to get more teachers into more bachelor's programs for early childhood. 
Um, as a professor at American Jewish University, I didn't share that I have also been doing that um, in my original bio, but that's a place where I have loved to teach. Um, we see the power of education in supporting teachers and helping them get to the next level of deepening their educational practice. And we can't have teachers losing their own personal funds to be able to enter a job at a high educational level where they're still not making enough money to repay back their loans. Like I think that one major initiative is to help empower individuals in our country to go to school and to not just have that school free to get stipends and then to support them when they're actually doing the work in the field. That would definitely get more teachers into the field. Oh, that's a great idea. Um, you know, there is the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the um, public service loan forgiveness program. I know part of the problem is most people don't know about it. The ones that do know about it don't know how to access it. And those that know how to access it don't necessarily know how to, how to avail themselves of it. So it is a very poorly laid out program, um, but definitely something that could move forward. <clears throat> I also wonder how we can engage teenagers and college students in early childhood work. I know I went to Brandeis University. There was an early childhood center on campus. I worked 15 <laughs> hours a week all through school because I loved working with kids. <clears throat> Um, and I was an elementary education major, but along the way, I received my license in early childhood education because I just had so many hours and courses. And then at the end of college, I realized I don't want to work in an elementary school. This is where the foundation begins, and I want to focus on the social <coughs> work that needs to happen in early childhood centers. So goodbye elementary school. And I think that if we engaged more people at a younger age in the importance of early childhood work, that's where we could tell them about these loan forgiveness <laughs> programs, about stipends yeah. to go to school and really inspire them. Even internships in the summer. Yeah. Or, yeah. <clears throat> I think my voice is finally going, uh, the natural ending to this. Um, <clears throat> Sasha, I do want to do this again. Uh, Let's do this again. I, wait. <clears throat> Benny, you're just going to edit this out. <coughs> no problem. <coughs> well, um, Tomorrow, if you want to mute yourself, you can mute yourself and cough it all out, and then we can bring it back. It's okay. You're just going to cut that little section out. OK. Um, hold on one sec. This is what happens when I don't have my, my, my monthly surgery on time. Do you have a water <laughs> bottle next to your tissues? Do you want some water? OK, no. Can I, can I share? Um, I have a, a once a month uh, surgical procedure that helps cl clear this out, but I'm overdue. Anyways, um, <clears throat> okay. So Sasha, you've laid out a lot of uh, really amazing ideas here. You've obviously played a lot when you were a child and have an amazing imagination to dream ways of solving these problems. Um, I definitely want to do this again with you. And um, what I would love to do is have a, have a chat next time uh, about actionable ways for our viewers and listeners to be able to make those differences. And even for some of the states that are making some headway for us to be able to provide them with that information, such as the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program that again, many people don't know exists or don't know how to access or, or avail themselves of and make sure that we're going to be that force that helps uh, bring up our field. Sasha, you are an amazing addition to the field of early childhood education nationwide. I have to say she's based on the East Coast, but I know that she does her work across the country. Sasha, do you want to share your information? How can people reach you if they want more information from you or about you? Thank you so much, Tamar. It was such a pleasure to have this conversation. I felt you like you were just across the table from me, that we were in yeah, the same room. Were. Um, I have loved learning with you and love the opportunity to talk about early childhood with you. Any state, any time zone, it's really wonderful. Um, you can find me on my website at sashacop.com. Um, you can send a connection message to me there um, or find me on Instagram at sashacop. There you go. So. Uh, I would suggest highly that you all start following her. 
Uh, she's got some amazing resources and she's uh, somebody who knows a lot in the field. Sasha, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Until next time, uh, I'm Dr. Tamar Andrews and I'm on the playground.